hiring the right people, hiring qualified staff is hands down the single best investment you can make in your practice. This is the business of architecture. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm your host, Enoch Sears, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Ryan Willard. Ryan, hello. Hello there. And so today we're going to be talking about a subject that is very near and dear to our hearts, something that's very challenging in today's world and managing an architectural practice, and that is finding qualified architectural staff. So what we typically find is that when recessions hit, everyone's a lot of people are let go. There's an abundance of people looking for jobs. And then when times are good, like we're happening right now in many industries, many markets right now, is that there's a scarcity of staff. Everyone's everyone's they're they're oversubscribed in terms of the work they're doing. Uh, they're they're drowning in too much work and they're ready to hire. They're looking for people, but they put out job ads and they're getting dozens of resumes, tons of resumes, but none of them are qualified. And so there's a, there's a feeling of resignation, a feeling of, well, I just guess I can't hire. I mean, it's really hard to hire in this market, right? So what we'd have you consider today is that, yes, it is hard. However, with the right strategies and solutions and techniques and processes that you can hire very qualified people, even in the toughest job market. But you're going to have to do it other than the typical way that most practice owners do it, which is by intuition, by just putting out a job ad and sort of like the, I'm going to put a job out there in the marketplace. I'm going to wait and see. I'm going to hope I get some applications, right? Now, Ryan, what are some of the, let's talk a bit about some of the challenges that cause practices to be in a position where they need to hire. Um, so we've obviously had COVID and the great resignation and people feeling disillusioned perhaps with their architectural career or their engineering careers and they've gone off to seek you know greener pastures elsewhere so there has been a lot of that type of thing that has happened which has meant people have 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 left um we're seeing a lot of you know kind of inexperienced people or inexperienced um younger architects um where the supply is the supply for experience is you know it's short and that's a very valued asset and so we're getting a lot of younger architects going into practices and being able to command much higher salaries now that's not necessarily a, a bad thing um but it it does mean that when it's out of balance, what we're starting to see, I mean, I've seen it in the West Coast, for example, practices hiring younger architects, they're getting paid up at the six figure level. And as soon as there's going to be any vulnerability to the business, then those guys are going to get, they're going to lose their jobs the most quickly. And when, when you've got a team of inexperienced getting paid more than the experienced architects, it's going to cause problems. Yeah, and something else that we see as well is oftentimes because it's a lot easier to find people in that sort of one to five year range of experience, oftentimes what practice owners will do is they'll, um, the investment to bring on someone like that is less. Uh, the time it might take to find a person like that is shorter. And so oftentimes practice owners are thinking, that's where I have to go. I'm going to find someone that's fresh out of college or a few years out of college, and I'm going to hire them on which is great. And that's definitely how I'm glad that people did that for me that allowed me to grow and to learn architecture and to become the architect that I became. Having a business model that relies on people with one to five years of experience, however, puts an enorm inordinate strain. It puts a very, very large strain on the experienced members of the practice because now you've brought in someone that you're not only just producing the work, but you're actually now in a position of actually teaching them and mentoring them, which is great. Nothing wrong with that. We love, I mean, I'm a mentor by heart. I know Ryan is at heart. I know many practice owners. That's one of the parts they love about their practice is bringing up younger architects. However, when we look at it from a strict business sense of being able to run a practice that aligns with the firm owner's desires, which is to spend less time redlining, less time trying to correct mistakes, less time uh, or less stress having so much work that they can't get it done, right? Often the solution to this is to hire someone who is highly experienced, who can come in, who can run a project turnkey. And this is when we see the huge jumps forward in the lives and the experiences of practice owners is when they get out of that model of having to depend on what we might call a, um, a lower experienced workforce and they have a better, a more balanced approach in the office. 
where it's they're not very, being the ones that are forced to mentor. Yeah, it's it's a it's a very easy situation to find yourself in, and it makes a lot of sense. It's a bit reactive. I think that's one of the things to kind of bear in mind that yeah. um, it makes sense. Okay, it's cheaper to hire. Well, this is what I'm saying. It's not always cheaper nowadays because in, depending where you're at, because the su- supply is kind of so constrained. But there's this reaction of let me hire somebody who's less experienced. They come into the business and great, you're saving a few dollars um, by by that. But then you're losing an enormous amount of your resource and your capacity now helping and train somebody. And I do think that, you know, really, I mean, this is this is part and parcel, a, a larger conversation that looking at the looking at some of the um, structural issues of architectural education and the purpose of architectural education and do architectural students know what they're getting themselves into? Are they paying for, you know, a, a, a creative discipline that allows them to think about lots of different topics or are they more interested in becoming a professional and having all the skills to help them earn a salary or is it a both? That's another, that's another conversation, but we do have this handing off issue, which is difficult and you as a small, particularly as a small business, to take on younger members of staff, that's, you know, it's a risk. There's a risk. And so many times we hear the story of, I'm spending so much time training these guys, they don't know what to do. And then there's the kind of tensions that arise, then toxicity happens. Then it's not good for either, either side. Um, expectations are not clear. Um, resentment de- begins to develop between the, you know, the leadership and the and the team, and it can all be a very unpleasant experience. That's very expensive, very very expensive in terms of lost, you know, opportunities, um, as well as actual direct revenue, um, the slowing down of pace of delivery all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, once you do have somebody who's got a few years of experience, they're so burnt out by the experience of working with you because it was, they weren't expecting, they weren't expecting that. And then they leave. Yeah. Yeah. And then you most, start again. Well, yeah. <laughs> then you're back to where you start again. Well, most, most practice owners. So the first step, number one is to clearly, clearly identify what are the things that you need this role to actually do? And if you haven't had the rep role in the practice before, it's going to be a bit of a trial and error unless you work with a team like ours where we've done it for other practices and we can give you the template, right? But generally speaking, there's going to be a bit of trial and error if you're hiring this role for the first time, right? Now, generally what, what most architectural practice owners need, even at, even when they're very, very small, even when they have one or two staff members, what they really need, the role they really need is they need someone in the office that can take the product from A to Z completely and practically unsupervised. That's what most practice owners need. Because what does that allow them to do? That allows them to work then at the top of their pay grade, meaning they can focus on the $10,000 an hour work, the business development, the client relations, the strategy, the innovation, hiring and coaching team members, right? And then whatever part of the practice they enjoy doing, perhaps, the design. Okay. This is how a practice owner really builds a practice to suit their life is by being willing to bring in highly experienced team members. However, this goes back to one of the problems is that many small practices can't afford highly experienced team members. And then that goes back to other systemic issues of not charging enough, not being able to manage their project properly, not having the forecasting to see what, what's going to happen in the money over the next couple months. So all of these things relate together. So we can start to see how this hiring conversation instantly begins to blossom into touching a lot of different areas of the practice. Mm-hmm. What we will say today, though, if you're looking to find qualified architectural hires, what you need is a process. And we're going to suggest to you that a process is going to look something like this. It's going to look like identifying clearly what the role is that you're going to hire for. And this is no easy task. Because most practice owners that I've seen, they usually get this wrong or they get it a little bit off. And they only discover that after having the person on board for a couple months. Right, so after you identify that, then what you need to do is you need to create some sort of compelling campaign to be able to attract that kind of person. So the very specific person that you're looking for, uh, both psychographically in terms of their attitudes as well as the skill level. 
So if you think about there's if you think about kind of a graph with two axes, we talk about skill level or experience, and we talk about culture, which is like attitude. So these are the two critical ingredients when you're looking to hire, right? And then you overlay the role on top of that, so they become this nice picture of what you actually need. Now, typically, typically, coaching someone that's low on the culture quotient, meaning Typically, coaching someone that has a less than ideal attitude is going to be a lot harder than coaching someone on the skill level, which is why a lot of practice owners end up hiring people who are less experienced because they're like, hey, at least they have the right attitude or I can mold them and I can give them the skill, All right? So that definitely is true. However, what you really want, what you're really looking for to make your whole life easier is to have someone who's highly skilled in this upper quadrant, someone who's highly skilled as well as having a great attitude, Okay. When you get both of those things together, you're on the way to paving yourself just a fantastic practice of freedom and ease. Right? So not an old now, grumpy sod. What's that, Ryan? No, so not an old grumpy sod. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now, in terms of hiring, what we will say is that a proper hiring process includes much more than putting up a job posting on Indeed or LinkedIn or the local job board right? We want to invite you to consider your hiring as a marketing campaign. Consider that you're marketing for a position. You're promoting the position as an opportunity. So this is where it starts to get very interesting. This is what it takes to hire in a tight environment, right? It's like, it's like anywhere in business where you have a tight environment where there's, there's a lot of demand and little supply, the companies that start to rise to the top are the ones that are very, very good at marketing. In other words, the ones that are very good at getting a message out to the market, to reaching the people that they want to reach. So consider that your hiring problem is probably not a hiring problem. Probably what your hiring problem is, it's a marketing problem. It's a marketing and promotional problem. That's the root cause here. Okay. So you can take inventory. Um, how much time have you spent promoting the brand of your firm? How much time have you spent painting the picture of what a wonderful firm yours is to look at? How much time have you spent helping other architects and upper coming architects uh, understand that your firm is the kind of place where they want to work, right? How, many, how, much, how much time have you spent doing that? And if you haven't started doing that yet, what can you do to start doing that today? Okay, so the principle here is to think of your hiring as a marketing exercise. When we talk about marketing exercise, we're talking about leveraging different assets. We're talking about leveraging video. We're talking about leveraging social media. We're talking about leveraging the written word, written content, right? All these things go together to crafting ultimately what is a message that's going to resonate with the right person. Now, in addition to that, like any business development or marketing exercise, a lot of time direct outreach is required. So in a busy job market, there is going to be the need to actually call up people who probably already have positions and scout, right? This is just, it's just the same thing as if you were hunting for work. It's going to be the same thing. However, one of the challenges is most small practice owners are way too busy to be able to do this. And so the, the, the quick answer is, we'll hire a recruiter. Well, the problem is, is that most practice owners aren't making enough money or recruiters too expensive for them, or they're not confident that it'll work, Right. So all of these problems go back to what we call the business of architecture. They go back to money issues. They go back to management issues. They go back to mindsets about how you're running the practice. So just consider that what you think is a hiring problem actually isn't a hiring problem. It's not about the scarcity in the market. It's not about a lot of people have jobs now and it's difficult to find staff. It more deals with the way that you're currently running your practice. And that's a very uncomfortable truth to face. Um, But it's not uncommon. It's very common because they don't teach us this in architecture school. And um, especially if you graduate and doing business in a time when there's a recession or there's a lot of employees out there, in the past we may think, oh, you know what, the, these people, they just they showed up on my doorstep, which is great. And that's fine if you want to run an, uh, a practice that's organic, that is haphazard, that, that is not intentional and consistent. So Ryan, in smart practice, we teach something called, uh, we run, uh, well, we, we have a framework that we teach about hiring. Uh, we have, we run hiring workshops for our clients, showing them what we call the hiring process, which is a, um, a promotional based approach to be able to attract the right clients. So we've had, a, they've had a lot of success with this. 
one of our short clients uh, hired a business, hired another person on who's like almost principal level, but an experienced person who's now helping them out with the business development. Uh, they've almost doubled the firm's revenue. His own personal income has doubled because of this move. And this is the beautiful thing about hiring is one of the keys here on the psychological level is to take hiring from an expense and then turn it around into an investment. Right. Instead of looking at it as spending a lot of money to try to hire someone, look at it in the terms of, okay, I have money. How can I invest this money? How It's like like investing in a mutual fund or investing in a piece of real estate. You're investing in a person. And the beautiful part is, is that in your business, that investment, if you're earning 20% profit, where else are you going to find an investment like that? So hiring the right people, hiring qualified staff is, hands down, the single best investment you can make in your practice. And if it's your first time hiring, the first hire we always recommend is getting some sort of office admin help, whether it's a virtual assistant or an office administrator, but start with that. And you're going to start, what you'll find is as you hire someone, it may be scary to hire them, but what you'll find is that immediately you're going to start making more money because you're doing more work. And this is how practices grow. I think it's very interesting what, what, you, what you're saying there. You know, the first approach that we, we take with developing a hiring funnel, for example, is to look at what is the what are the current marketing assets that the company has what's the overall visibility that the company has and when that is poor or has been underinvested in then okay we, that's something that needs that's a ongoing consistent thing that needs to be done forever is continually building up thought leadership visibility both within the industry within your clients you should be doing this for winning work Anyway, uh-huh. being published, getting articles, producing whatever, you know, content or, you know, on, but the next level down from that, if you like, that there's the kind of big broadcasting to wide audiences. Well, let's look at your network. Mm-hmm. Who do you know? Who are you? What relationships have you been cultivating and developing? Because a wide, um, expansive network with, well, even a, a kind of small network with good relationships in it can quickly expand out into all sorts of regions and into different communities um and again if that's been neglected in the business then it's going to be difficult it's going to be it's going to be very very difficult because then you're going to have to rely on on only using other existing platforms of which you have not that much control on so that we so we see putting up a posting on indeed or we see putting a posting on linkedin and you know there's there's a moderate level of success with that but you know with linkedin if you don't have if you haven't been putting in some work about developing your network and building up your social media profile then you know you're going to have to throw money at it to try and get the to boost the posts and to boost the the visibility um and again it just becomes it becomes more and more ex- expensive, if you like, and in, and in part is is as a uh, a result of of many firms being reactive with their hiring. So you're only ever thinking about hiring when we need it, um, and therefore there's been a a neglect of marketing and positioning and visibility, um, and all those other wonderful ideas that I know most people have, but then don't do them because contract has been screaming down the phone or client has been needing help and assistance and we never had the time to to get around to do it and now we need to find somebody and that's and in a in a kind of contracted market it becomes even it becomes even harder also the not having visibility and a network makes it very difficult for people to think laterally or become inventive with how they might find a solution to getting the work delivered because there's number one, there's identifying what's the what does the business need right now, and the answer isn't always a, a hire that needs to come to my office and sit there and do the work. There's particularly in today's day and age where you've got the access to about eight billion people, or maybe seven billion people, because a billion people don't have the internet. Um, you know, we've where there is the possibility to create alternative working solutions to get to get a result so there's access to you know websites like upwork can be quite um can be quite interesting um making collaborations with other practices to leverage um, their drafting capacity when you're completely um tapped out um there are other economies other emerging economies places like 
in South America. We're seeing clients developing offices in places like Chile. And, you know, I, I myself have used outsources in Bolivia. Um, we've got people who are working with teams in India. You know, and this is becoming a much more common type of practice and requires a little bit of self self leadership and the ability to try and test and do something to do something different and you know many people are finding very very good good results we've got one client at the moment who you know a lot of their business has been modeled around building these kinds of outsourced teams and they've got a fantastic network of outsourcers and different groups that they can lean on and they've got a small core team of about four people and their staff are and their team are very well trained in being able to delegate work and to to locate and find outsourcers and to get creative with how they do the drafting and you know there isn't the pressure of you've got to do the drafting work it's, you know, how can you get the results done? How can you get the work done? And they're finding themselves in a position where they are now able to take on an increased workload um, without too much concern of getting overwhelmed because they've got, they've got like 15 different options of how they could develop the work and how the work can be outsourced um, creatively to, to other teams. So they've just got this, they've just got opportunity available and they're not going through the 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 you know, don't have to go through this long protracted clunky process of hiring somebody every time, which means they can spend more time hiring those higher level people, higher level people who can be more strategic, and they can really focus on you know making making a kind of much more um, um, powerful investment, if you like. Yeah, we've seen. I mean, we've seen a number of architectural practices going this route of having a more flexible team, which has a lot of advantages. Uh, as long as you find someone that can deliver very high quality product drawings, which of course is the challenge. And Ryan, you mentioned something that, that really resonated as very true, which is under, under investing in marketing has consequences. And this is one of the, this is what we might, this is what we call one of the hidden threats of architectural practice which is the idea that uh, we don't market our practice. Okay, now the reason why this is a threat or being too busy to market is because it's directly related to hiring, being able to hire the right team members, the right staff members. So as Ryan said, when you go to hire, if you don't have, uh, this is why things like social media followings are important, right? Things like having an email list, you know, but having a network that you have digital access to. So what network is comprised of relationships Having relationships, whether they're on LinkedIn, whether they're on uh, other social media platforms, whether you're on your email list, if you haven't invested over time, it takes time to build these assets. And so if you don't have these assets, then it's going to be very difficult to launch a good hiring campaign, right? But most small practice owners, they don't have the time or the know-how to start to develop these assets, which again, which is why we uh, develop smart practice method to help practice owners be able to cover all their bases and build the kind of practice that serves them. Because none of us are marketers. We weren't, you know, architects aren't, uh, weren't uh, taught how to market. Um, but it is such an essential skill. And it just goes to underline and underscore how many of the investments that, uh, that small practice owners should be making in their practice are not making just because they don't understand the ramifications of not making those investments until it's too late. Right, sort of like the the best time to plant a tree was twenty years ago, and the second best time is today. All right, Ryan. Well, thank you for also inspiring us to think laterally. There's a lot of very interesting things that can happen uh, to think about. How can I solve this need without necessarily bringing someone else on full time into the up into the practice? Are there ways we could team with other practices? Are there ways that we could use some sort of flex arrangement? Are there ways that we can connect with someone who provides these type of services that that we can use to be able to accelerate what we do so we can focus on our, our highest and best use? Uh, some of the most innovative practices I know today run very, very small and lean teams. Four people, five people doing incredible designs, and that's all they focus on. And then they have an outsourced team or network of other firms that they use to actually produce the work. So yeah. Think about it laterally. There, there's a lot of different ways to solve this problem. And, uh, you know, the key here is being innovative. Perhaps you'll even come up with a way that no one's thought of yet and be able to innovate once again in the practice of architecture. So when we're thinking laterally about 
our businesses, another exercise that we can do is look at where the most value is created in our workflow. And for different businesses, this is going to be different. There's going to be a different stage of work where mm -hmm. you're the most profitable. For different businesses, there's going to be a different stage of work where your client perceives the most value is being created. So for example, I was speaking with uh, an architecture practice the other day who are very dominant and masterful in the hospitality sector down in Texas and around the world. And they work with these extraordinary clients on some of the world's most beautiful and exquisite hotels and resorts. And they've been very, very niche and focused in their, um, in their sector and developed quite an incredible set of expertise around it. And they looked at where the value was in their, in their business and where they bring the most value. And they wanted to keep a small team as well and keep a kind of boutique team and their, their team's about 40 people. So it's, it's not that small for an architecture firm, but it's, you know, in bigger picture, it's a, that's a small, that's a small business. And they recognize that the most value that they create is in the design process is in the upfront design stages, not in the, con in, the, in the contract administration or the production drawings, but right in the early upfront stages of drawing. So they just decided that we're not going to do that rest of the projects. Um, we're going to work closely with a local partner, depending on where the location of the hotel is, and we'll find other teams to do that other part of the project. And we're just going to focus where we can bring the most value, where our brand is orientated around and... You know, it also sets up a model where they're selling value, they're not selling hours. And I think that's very interesting. You look at some of the practices like Renzo Piano and the Rogers and the Fosters of the world, they have a similar kind of setup where they are working, you know, they're putting a, a, an enormous amount of energy into these upfront stages. And in many cases, they're producing a lot, so much detailed information about the, the design in the in the kind of, early stages of projects that you probably could build off some of the drawings that they produce. And then they work with a, a larger company like a Pascal Watson type of co uh, company that would do all the um, detailed drawings and construction drawings for an airport, for example. Um, and the architect might retain a kind of concept guardian type of position to ensure that quality and that there is a continuous thread of contribution throughout the project. So that becomes quite interesting, you know, and again, for another practice, it might be that your, that your skill set, really the value that you bring is in the, con is in, is in the latter stages of a project. So when we're looking at hiring, it becomes interesting to consider, well, actually, how can we streamline our workflow and how much involvement we have and really just double down on the, on the elements of the project that we're really, really, we excel at. And then we can do more with a smaller team and we can then focus on a more value-based pricing model, become more profitable and we don't have to, we're not, we don't have to have a big inflated um, team and manage parts of the process that we're not that, that we don't enjoy, that we're not good at, that aren't, aren't best suited. Okay. Again, for other architects, it might be maintaining that golden thread all the way through a project. Okay. So there might be a, a different way where they, where they need to, you know, ensure that there's some sort of continuous, continuous involvement. But I, I do think that's, you know, that's, that's one of the things that's happened in, in the architecture industry is that other so-called specialists, if you like, have looked at the architectural workflow and taken chunks out of it and say, we're specialists in this bit. We're specialists in project management. And you know what? A lot of them market and sell themselves far better than, many architecture practices and you know they come at it from a, uh, from a commercial perspective and they're able to sell the value and then we have the kind of industry situation that we have today but that's it's on us we have no one to blame but ourselves <laughs> all right well thank exactly. you for listening today ryan thank you for joining me for this stimulating conversation about hiring we've we've touched on a number of things number one that hiring is a marketing problem first and foremost. 
uh, number two, that a lot of times it deals with their own confidence and going out to the marketplace to be able to find and hire those people. Number three, that we can think laterally, that there's a lot of different ways to be able to solve the problem that doesn't necessarily involve hiring someone. Ryan, if people want to find out more, as always, they can go to smartpracticemethod.com, get access to our free 60-minute firm owner training. Uh, Just enter your email address on that page and we'll send it right over to you. Ryan, have an amazing day and as always, carpe diem. Bye for now. Thank you so much, Enoch. And that's a wrap. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.